4.2, observational studies and experiments. Uh, our first objective is to distinguish between these two vocab terms. So first one is an observational study, um, and that's something that observes individuals, hence the word observational. It observes individuals and measures variables of interest, but does not attempt to influence the results or the responses. So it's just making observations, doesn't actually impose anything on the study or try to influence the response, versus where we have an experiment. So an experiment deliberately imposes some treatment on the individuals to measure their responses. Okay, so um, if we want to understand cause and effect for whatever variable, if we want to try to establish a cause and effect relationship, experiments are the only source of fully convincing data. The only way to establish cause and effect is by conducting experiment. Um, so the distinction between these two things, between an observational study and an experiment, is actually one of the most important you're going to find in statistics in this class and for the AP exam. So can you clearly distinguish between what an observational study is and what an experiment is? Okay, so in contrast to observational studies, experiments, they don't just observe individuals or ask them questions like a survey. A survey would be an example of an observational study. They don't just observe them. Experiments, they actively impose some treatment and try to measure its effects. So this next piece is an actual study. It's an article. Uh, it says, ADHD linked to lead and mom smoking. A mother smoking during pregnancy and exposure to lead significantly increases her child's risk for developing attention deficit hyperactivity, hyperactivity disorder, otherwise known as ADHD, say researchers. In fact, as many as one-third of cases of ADHD in children are linked to exposure to tobacco smoke and lead before birth, giving moms yet another reason to quit smoking during pregnancy. For the study... Researchers from Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center surveyed over 4,700 children between the ages of 4 and 15 and their parents. Over 4% of the children included had ADHD. The researchers found that those children whose mother smoked during pregnancy were over twice as likely to develop ADHD than a child whose mother had not smoked. So the question is this. Based on this study, should we conclude that smoking during pregnancy actually causes an increase in the likelihood that a child develops ADHD. Okay, so uh, we've touched on this a little bit already, but um, you know it, it may actually be somewhat of a cause, like smoking during pregnancy. But does this study prove it? And the answer is no. Um, and the reason it's no is because this was actually just an observational study and not an experiment. So the key is that if we're going to say something causes it. We need to actually do an experiment. This study, and here's the key word, they surveyed children and their parents. So that is an observational study. So that's the point. This doesn't actually prove that smoking during pregnancy causes ADHD in children. So this was only an observational study, not an experiment. So why does that not prove it? So this definitely shows an association because these people smoked and the children had ADHD. So there must be an association there, but it doesn't prove the causation piece. It doesn't prove that that smoking is actually the true cause for these kids' ADHD. If you wanted to actually prove that, you would need to do an experiment. So we can't rule out other confounding, that's our new keyword other confounding factors, like lead, for example, or any other uh, health-related um, occurrence, for that matter. Um, these moms that smoke during pregnancy, they may have done a lot of other things, so we can't really pinpoint smoking as being the reason for these, these kids' ADHD. Um, other factors that could have been the lead exposure, you know, maybe alcohol, drugs, maybe it's just hereditary. Maybe um, it's not caused by smoking at all. We can't actually prove it unless we were to do an experiment. So this idea of confounding variables, why we can't distinguish 
whether it's the smoking or the lead or any of those other factors, what does that mean in the context of this study? Confounding. And it almost means like confusing. Like we're confusing more than one variable at a time. So for this study, the actual cause of the ADHD in the kids, it may be due to variables other than smoking, and we just can't prove it. We can't prove exactly what variable it is. So that would be confounding. Like we're confusing multiple factors here, and we can't distinguish which one it is for sure, especially because it's an observational study. So we're unable to say for sure the true cause. Scroll down here. Um, is there any way to actually prove then that smoking during pregnancy is actually what causes ADHD? Okay, like I said before, we would actually have to conduct an experiment to do this. But the question is, is that even um, plausible to conduct an experiment like this? And the answer is no, because honestly, to prove it, you would have to have a group of mothers um, that you would assign to actually smoke during their pregnancy and compare that to another group of mothers who didn't smoke during their pregnancy, compare those two groups, the ones that smokes, the ones that doesn't smoke, and then see if the ones that smoke had a higher rate of ADHD. That would be a way to prove it. But obviously you can't do that. That's an unethical thing to do. So to do it, we'd have to actually conduct an experiment with a group of mothers smoking and a group non-smoking for comparison. However, that is highly unethical, um, so really there's no way to technically prove that smoking causes the higher incidence of ADHD, although it may. Okay, so observational studies in general um, the effect of an explanatory variable, they study this, right? They study the effect of an explanatory variable on a response variable, often fail because of confounding. They can't distinguish between what caused the response. So the cure for that is a well-designed experiment. They take steps to prevent confounding. And let's actually give the definition for confounding. So confounding occurs when two variables are associated in such a way that their effects on a response variable cannot be distinguished from each other. Again, so like they're confusing them together. That's what confounding means. So what's the difference between an explanatory variable and a response variable? Two new vocab terms for this chapter. Okay. Well, first I want to ask you this question. Based on the logic we just saw, do parachutes actually work? So I just said uh, on the last example that we couldn't technically prove that smoking caused ADHD because we would never be able to conduct uh, that type of experiment because it's unethical. Well, so by that logic, no one has technically proven that parachutes actually work because to prove that you would have to conduct an experiment. One group jumps out of a plane with parachutes. The other group jumps out of a plane without parachutes. And then that would prove whether or not parachutes actually work. So if you're proving cause and effect, like the cause of you surviving is your parachute. The effect was you survived. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like um, you know a funny question. It's kind of rhetorical. Do parachutes actually work? Well, no one's ever actually done a well-designed experiment to answer that question. Plus, i got to put a nice little parachute guy here in the notes. So, back to explanatory variable. What is an explanatory variable? Well, it explains, or like the cause, it's the cause for the reaction or the result. So the explanatory variable, 
That's what we're trying to say uh, accounts for the reaction or what we see in the experiment. And then the response is what happens after that reaction. So that's like what describes or measures the result. So two key vocab terms there, explanatory variable, and then the response variable. Okay, so when we're designing experiments, and this is what we're gonna focus on for the next um, few sections. It's called the caffeine experiment. So suppose we wanted to design an experiment to see if caffeine affects pulse rate, because we're actually going to prove it. So here's an initial plan, an outline for it. So measure the initial pulse rate, pulse rate for the person. Then we're going to give each student some caffeine. Wait for a specified time, maybe 30 minutes. And then measure their final pulse rate after that time. And then when we get done, we're going to compare the initial and final pulse rates Okay, so what would be some problems with this type of plan? And then what are the other variables um, that would be a source of variability or even confounding in this type of experiment? Okay, well, the biggest glaring issue that I'm thinking of is this outline literally plans to give um, caffeine to like every student I'm thinking. So there's actually a couple problems with that. One is you don't have a control group to compare it to. Like, if you give caffeine to the entire group, you don't have anyone in that group that, or in that um, population that didn't have caffeine. So you can't have like a caffeine group versus a no caffeine group for comparison. So that's the first um, problem. So there's no control group, which, mean, which means a group of students without caffeine to compare results with. Um, and then other variables that we would consider would also create issue. I mean, first of all, we talk about giving caffeine to every kid. I, there's a little bit of, um, it's a little bit unethical. One, I mean, what about you consider like students with heart issues? They would have to um, not be in the study. Um, what's another factor that goes with pulse rate? So. Fitness level, definitely, um, if kids with different fitness levels, they're going to have different pulse rates, probably with or without caffeine. So that's another variable um, that could be confounding with the caffeine, fitness levels. Or um, how about previous caffeine that day? So that's something that we'd have to account for. These kids that showed up to class with coffee in their hand, they've already had caffeine. Or... My personal favorite, caffeine tolerance. Mine being very, very low, of course, so I'd be a very high responder to a cup of coffee, let's say. Scrolling down, so there's several steps we should take to solve these problems. First one, obviously, is actually include a control group. So that's a group that doesn't actually receive caffeine. So we have something to compare that caffeine group to. So like half the kids get caffeine, half the kids don't get caffeine. So we have actually a control group that gets nothing. So we have a group to compare with. Um, otherwise, any changes in pulse rate would be confounded with the caffeine. And we talked about um, a lot of the other variables that could go into play um, with confounding. Um, perhaps the biggest, which I haven't mentioned yet, uh, an amazing stats lecture to really get your heart rate up right before we do the, the study. And then you, will, you couldn't tell if it was due to the caffeine or the amazing, amazing stats lecture, per usual. Last page of the notes here, experimental vocabulary. I'm going to add some terms to our vast uh, statistics vocab here. So a specific condition applied to the individuals in an experiment. So what you actually impose on the individuals is this a treatment. The experimental units is our next term. Experimental units are the smallest collection of individuals to which treatments are applied. When the units are human beings, they are often called subjects. So that was pretty much mean the same thing. Experimental units, um, what you're applying the treatment to, 
Um, in the case of their people, you would just call them subjects. And then our next focus vocab word here is a factor. So we talk about like what factors influence uh, ADHD, and what factors influence heart rate. So this just says a variable whose levels are controlled by the experimenter. So in the caffeine experiments, like the factor, one of the factors would have been caffeine. Next one, from the factor we go to level. So you can adjust um, different levels of the factor or, or adjust the levels for each factor, say um, different levels of caffeine. So specific values that the experimenter chooses for a factor. Um, and then we have explanatory variable and response variable. So explanatory variables attempt to explain the relationship and response variables, um, that's the dependent variable that responds to the other variable being used. So um, in terms of the caffeine experiment we talked about, what would be the treatment? Well, the treatment we're actually giving the students was actually just the caffeine. So the treatment would be the caffeine given to students. The experimental units, the thing we are experimenting or the things we are experimenting on. Well, that's just the students in our, in our experiment. So the students involved in the experiment. Scroll down. Uh, the subjects, again, that's a, this means the same thing as the experimental unit. So our subjects, again, were the students involved in the survey. Or not the survey, this is an experiment. The factor, um, the factor we're trying to use, uh, that's actually just the caffeine. We're trying to say caffeine is what affects the pulse rate. So there's only one factor for our experiment. That would be caffeine. Other factors that would affect pulse rate, um, physical activity would raise your pulse rate, or anxiety. So there, there are other factors, but for our experiment, we're only going to observe one factor. And then the level would be how much caffeine uh, we actually give each student. And um, the way we defined it, they would all get the same amount of caffeine. And I would misspell caffeine in the last part of the notes here. I had to write all those other times. E-I-N-E. -E. Come on. All right, that's all for these notes, experiments, and observational studies. I'll see you in class.